Hello, my name is Charlie Turner, uh, and my community are Rohingya refugees. It wasn't my first choice. Uh, initially, it was the diaspora of Burma as a whole. But after this, the violence in August, I decided to focus specifically on this refugee group. I reported in Burma a little bit last year, so, but it was mainly on labor rights. So this world's both foreign and familiar to me at the same time. Quickly, just some background, just so we're all on the same page. That's Burma, okay? It, it was a military dictatorship for over 50 years. It's changed, stayed the same. Um, the w one group that it hasn't changed for are ethnic minorities of the country. There are 135 ethnic groups that are native to Burma. That doesn't even include the Rohingya, and we'll get to that in a second. The, the ethnic majority group are the Bama, or Burman. That includes Aung San Suu Kyi, the military leadership. Um, they make up about two thirds, I mean, sorry, three quarters of the country. Um, and the military has been responsible for dominating ethnic minorities. And there are many of them, and many of them live in the United States. In the past 10 years, no country has produced more refugees than Burma. That includes the Karen, a largely Christian group, the Kachin, a largely Christian group, the Chin, a largely Christian group, and of course the Rohingya, who are majority Muslim. There are roughly 7,500 living in the US now as refugees. This is one of the few that actually lives in New York City. As um, I'm sure you guys watch the news, uh, persecution of ethnic minorities in Burma is widespread, but to a much lesser degree compared to the Rohingya. In August, 600,000 Rohingya refugees went to Bangladesh in the span of four months. So since very few Rohingya refugees live in New York, I've had to communicate with them mainly over messenger services. Uh, the Chicago-Milwaukee area is a huge uh, Rohingya hotspot. Um, I th you know, just basically any towns that have economic problems, refugees are sent there. Um, but I didn't limit myself to the states. I, Canada and Ireland were huge spots for me as, as well. And WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger were the only ways I've communicated with them. Facebook in Burma is the internet. It's how the searches are done. It's how entertainment's found. It's how news is gathered. From listening to my community, I learned that the needs are dire. Um, the literacy rate in refugee camps in Bangladesh hovers around 12%, but, uh, and that's basically the same here in the States. It's a little bit higher, but literacy is a huge issue. Uh, so how can I help a community that has trouble reading as a journalist? I firmly believe if anyone wants to pursue VR or AR, there's huge ways that you can help the refugee community doing that. I chose not to do that this year. I decided to focus on informational needs. And so listening to some of the, to the community, I learned that context and reporting is really missing. Everyone here has probably heard of the Rohingya. Very few probably know who the Rohingya are, how the history of the situation, why they're so persecuted. So using my platform at Wiki Tribune, I'm an intern and now I'm a staff reporter for Wiki Tribune. It's the news venture of Wikipedia and Jimmy Wales. I wrote an explainer explaining why the Rohingya are so persecuted. It's a new site. It's mainly just kind of like experts and friends of the organization that read it. So it's gathered roughly 500 views. But what I was really encouraged about is the talk page. And that's where readers can speak to me about uh, things that are missing from coverage. And then I take those into account and augment my reporting. I also heard that the when was missing from these reports in international media. Um, no one realizes that this issue has gone on for decades. So I interviewed survivors from 1978, the first ethnic cleansing campaign against the Rohingya, and created as cl the closest thing to I could of an oral history. Um, since it's wiki format, my dream is that refugees and refugee groups add to this, and we have an oral history that starts from World War II, which is roughly when Burma got independence, until now. There have been about three massive clearance operations from the Myanmar military. Oh, and that, this has gathered about 600, 600 views. Um, this is a, a reply when I tweeted it out. For decades, yes, from since 1978. No, they weren't displaced from Bangladesh, and they squatted in Myanmar for 1942. This is a reference to the Rohingya being illegal immigrants 
from Bangladesh, which is a widespread uh, misconception or kind of slander against this ethnic group. And this brings me to the biggest need of my community, is that the people that they need the support from the most are the people from Burma, and they're not getting it. Bigotry is a huge problem for my community. Um, essentially, I hate to say it, if I had to guess there's no poll, but the majority of people from Burma that aren't Rohingya probably would side with the government and not the ethnic group themselves. Uh, this is someone who's a, you know, a very educated um, Rakhine, which is another ethnic group living in America, and she essentially thinks that the media coverage of the Rohingya is overblown and uh, inaccurate. But there is a need for solidarity and there is a desire for it. Uh, this is a blog post from an ethnic uh, women's group, the Korean Women's um, Organization, and they essentially gave sympathy to Rohingya women because they too faced uh, rape as a weapon, village burning, and other ethnic cleansing campaigns themselves. This Christian group in southern Burma is offering solidarity to the Rohingya, and my community were in love with this post. They thought it was the greatest thing ever. They finally felt heard from people in Burma for the first time, and that kind of gave me the, an idea, um, which is dialogue journalism. I don't know if you guys have heard of Spaceship Media. It's a group, they connected Donald Trump supporters with Hillary Clinton supporters, and they spoke over Facebook. I'm gonna, I decided to do this, but with the ethnic groups of Burma. Of course, it's gonna have to be a little different because this issue is way more personal than the Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton election, it just is. Um, for one, there we're talking about you know, sexual abuse is widespread amongst my community. Um, people feel that they aren't a real ethnic group, so this is really a true identity question. So I wanted to avoid this, this is not a debate. I wanted this to be about people speaking about their identity while another ethnic group, uh, while another person from another ethnic group was present, and they can share and uh, stories about their ethnic identity and what it means to be from Burma, whether they're proud of their country, uh, whether they think the media coverage of their country is fair. So I used Zoom conference call. It was me, one person from one ethnic group, and another from another ethnic group. And I always tried to put a Rohingya person in unless I felt like the other person would attack them. So I, it, it involved um, a bit of a vetting process. And some of the highlights that I found um, were that people are, are open to talking about this issue. Like I said, I had to vet people. But uh, this person right here, who's an ethnic Korean, agreed to stop using a racial slur for Rohingya people after meeting a Rohingya person for the first time. And that's another thing. There are people that have never met a Rohingya person in their life. The majority of them haven't. But they have deeply bigoted views towards this ethnic group. Um, so I can't tell if that's typical or surprising. And then here is an ethnic Rohingya uh, woman. And she essentially told us and, everyone, and the, person, the other person in the group that she considers Bengali to be a racial slur which is what Burmese people call Rohingya people to kind of reference that they don't belong in the country. They're actually native to Bangladesh. So just to kind of recap what I learned is that there is a need for solidarity amongst my community. Um, focus on the youth when you have to because young people are more likely to be more open-minded and multicultural compared to older folks. Um, and then just kind of on a more macro level, Traditional journalism just really doesn't break ec echo chambers as much as kind of putting the community at the center of the reporting process. Um, I do believe that journalists have a role as moderators, and that means kind of extending away from debates. Uh, debates are really better if you have experts or blowhards, right? But if you have thoughtful people who want to listen, maybe they don't know that much about the issue, they don't, they're not going to survive in a debate format. But what they can do is talk about their experience and hear how another ethnic group responds to the same questions. Uh, so I do think dialogue journalism has a future. And what I'm going to do is once I get a good sample size of these conversations, I'm going to report out on it. Um, and I'm not sure what that's going to look like. It's going to involve a lot of video and audio from these conversations. Um, and then from there, I want to make sure that I am producing something that's constructive and that helps both of my communities feel represented. I think the main thing for other people that want to try this is that just know that dialogue journalism is about putting a voice into someone else's head. Um, and that voice might not be convincing, 
but it can develop an understanding. And I think the job of journalists is to make these interactions constructive and then report out from the insights that they learned. Thank you.